mention that at the back of the worship folder, I wrote some uh, discussion questions that you might want to use during the week um, for your uh, devotions. And also, at the end of the message, I'm going to, we're going to be reading together um, a few statements off the screen. And I have those statements as an insert in your bulletin so you can take them home and uh, they can continue percolating in our lives. <clears throat> please, uh, please pray in your hearts with me. Heavenly Father, please let the next few minutes be of meaning and of help to all of us who identify ourselves as followers of Jesus so that we might live for him this week. And we pray in his name. Amen. So this week I had fun thinking about all the different ways that we identify who we are. Um, and so I came up with a, a, a list here. We're not going to use all of them, but for example, politically, uh, if we identify ourselves, I might be a, a liberal, uh, a conservative, or I might identify myself as an independent, just as an example. Or on the socioeconomic scale, based on what the government says the upper, middle, and lower economic class is, I identify myself inside one of those classes. Um, or culturally, we're all so different, right? Some of us love opera and orchestra, and others of us love George Jones and George Strait, and, and we love the rodeo, and we love NASCAR. And we have all different ways of defining who we are in the sense of uh, what kind of cultural events we like. Academically, we're very different. Some of us have been blessed to get to go to school and get upper graduate degrees, and some of us were just thankful to, to finish fourth grade well, and we, we move through life in that way. And that's fine, man. We identify in that way. Um, let's look at giftedness. Some of us identify, yes, I'm gifted as an athlete. I'm gifted as, uh, in areas of arts. I'm gifted to be a teacher. I'm gifted as a people person. All of us identify on the basis of the gifts that God has given us. Personality, that's also how we identify ourselves. So for example, um, one of us will say, and I'm an extrovert, and the other one will shyly say, I'm an introvert. I'm the life of the party. And the person next to us will say, I'm the wallflower. Don't look at me at the party. Um, some of us will say, uh, I love tough decisions. I love making tough, bring on your tough decisions. Others will say, oh, don't make me make a hard decision. It's so hard for me. So we have all different ways of categorizing ourselves, identifying ourselves. But this morning we're going to look at identifying ourselves spiritually. And so we start out by saying, right, we're Christians. We're not Buddhists, we're not Hindus, we're not Muslims, we're not Jehovah's Witness, we're not Mormons, we're Christians. And then if you want to narrow it down, many of us gathered here would say, I'm also a Christian and a Lutheran. And we also might say, many of us would say, well, I'm a, a Christian Lutheran and I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and the source of all the important information for us. And then we get down farther, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Now, when we get down to that level, uh, it's possible that we might have different identity crises as we hear different things and maybe believe wrong things and we get confused about who exactly are we as followers of Jesus. I mean, if cows and cats and even tomatoes can have identity crises, it can happen in our lives as Christians also. Now, the reason this is important is because in Philippi, where Paul was writing our first Bible lesson for today, chapter 3 of Philippians, there were some people who had infiltrated the Christian congregation there. And these people who were trying to convince the Christians that believing in Jesus to be saved alone, that wasn't enough. The Judaizers were saying that believing in Jesus is fine, but you have to get circumcised if you are a, um, a, a Gentile to be saved. Jesus isn't enough. You need to put in some effort yourself. And to the Jews, they would say things like, Sure, Jesus saves you, but you better obey Moses' law. You better obey the, the Passover meal this year. You better be in contact with how you can work on the basis of your good works to be good enough in God's eyes to help save yourself. And the result was that in Philippi, the Christians were getting confused about who they were. Am I a Christian who's saved by faith alone in Christ alone on the basis of God's mercy alone? 
Or am I a person who believes in that but also is worried because i got to keep trying to obey better, sin less, and do more for the Lord in order to be saved? Which is true. And so um, these ideas of the Judaizers can also creep into our lives today. In our pride, we might get the wrong idea that, well, maybe I'm not so sinful. Maybe I don't need to be hearing about sin all the time. Or maybe... I do deserve some of God's salvation because I'm certainly not as bad a sinner as some people I know. Or maybe a thought creeps into our mind. You know, I've helped so many people. I've worked so hard in the church for so many years. Maybe I can contribute to my salvation. And then on the other side of our weaknesses, you know, the Bible says that we we can be strong in the face of temptation in the strength of the Lord But instead of believing that, I start believing, no, I'm not very strong in the face of temptation. Or um, I can think, boy, among the sins I've committed, there are some doozies. So maybe I'm not forgiven of all my sins, maybe just some of them. Or another uh, false idea that can creep in is I know what the Bible says about life after death, but I hear so many theories about what happens after life, after death. Now I'm not even sure if I'm going to heaven when I die. So um, identity crises can occur in your life and in my life today. And that's why today we're asking the question, who are you? Who am I as a follower of Jesus? And we're going to look through what St. Paul wrote in chapter 3 of Philippians. And we're going to let that information from God's word Remind us exactly who we are and what we're not as followers of Jesus. Please come along with me. We're going to look at Paul's words here. He starts out by saying, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, Paul says. Now what this means is that the Judaizers were saying to the people, You need to um, make human effort to obey God to be good enough, and maybe then you can be saved. That's what confidence in the flesh means here. Flesh here does not mean old sinful nature. It means human effort. I'm putting confidence and trust in myself to be good enough, to be considered good enough in God's eyes to be saved. And Paul says, if that's what the Judaizers were saying, I have a a lot of reason to be confident because of a lot of things in my life. So here's Paul's list. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just like God's word commands. I'm of the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not just from any tribe. I'm from Benjamin. If you remember that when Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel divided, and ten tribes of the north started worshiping Baal gods, and only two remained faithful to Jehovah, and they were Judah and they were Benjamin. So when Paul says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, he was saying, I come from really good spiritual stock. Um, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I can trace my ancestry from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee before I came to know Jesus. I obeyed God's laws more strictly than anybody else in the Jewish community. And he says, as for zeal, before I came to know Jesus, I didn't just talk about my faith. I tried to kill people like Christians who were saying that a person could be saved by faith alone instead of working your way to heaven. So Paul is saying, I was zealous. And then he says, as far as righteousness based on the law is, that means as far as being good enough by my behavior to be considered by God worthy of heaven, Paul says, year after year, he kept getting the same score. Faultless. (laughs) So what Paul is saying so far is, hey, you Judaizers who are saying that you have to be good enough to be saved and not just believe in Jesus, St. Paul is saying, well, look at me. But he, he had a reason for this, because look what he says next. He says, but whatever were, were, past tense, gains, that is, gains for being saved, to me, I now, after believing in Jesus, I consider them loss. Why? Because I know Jesus, who took away all my sins. What is more... I consider everything a loss, everything that I might be, all my good spiritual inheritance and everything. It's all a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. He's, Paul is saying, that's all I need. All I need is Jesus. 
for whose sake I have lost all things, um, and I consider them garbage, in order that I can stick with Jesus as my one and only Savior. If we would put these words into today's language, we might hear something like this. Some people might think that there's a bank of good works that is like my bank of salvation and it can help me get to heaven. And so in my case, um, the false ideas would be, hey, look at me, I've been baptized. Did you know that my daddy was a pastor? That ought to count for something. Um, I've been going to Lutheran schools all my life. I've done a lot of good to help other people. And I've worked in the church for a long time. Certainly, my bank account is full and I should be headed for heaven. Now, Paul says that is rubbish, that is false, that is dangerous, those ideas. He is saying that all of these things, after you come to know Jesus, all of these good things that you and I might be or have done, it's all loss. It doesn't help a bit. In fact, he says, not only are they lost, they're dangerous because if I trust in them instead of Jesus, they're going to impede my salvation. And that's why Paul says, I consider them all garbage. And I want to get them out of my life. And I want to be stuck on only one thing, and that is the cross of Jesus. I don't trust in what I am or what I've done. I only trust in what Jesus is and what Jesus has done for me. As he took my sin, my guilt, my punishment in my place, he is all I need to be a saved sinner in God's eyes. And look at how Paul continues then. He says, all I want is to be found in him, not in my good works. And not having a righteousness of my own. Righteousness means to be declared innocent in God's court of law. And he says, I'm not looking for one that's based on my ability to obey the law. The only righteousness that exists is the one that is through faith in Christ and it comes from God. And so please notice there's three elements of salvation here. First of all, it's from God. It's not from me. It's from his mercy, his undeserved love to love me. And also it's from Christ in that Jesus did everything necessary to win for me a full and free forgiveness. And it's through faith. Faith means that I'm trusting in him. And I'm not trusting in me. I'm not trusting in who I am or what I've done. Because it won't save me. It won't wash away my sin. Only Jesus will. So Paul is defining very clearly. So that nobody needs to have an identity crisis about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He says, all I want to do is know Christ. And the power of his resurrection as the culminating part of what he did to save me. And, and I'm looking forward to participation in his sufferings. That means that Paul is saying that um, if other people are going to hate me or even hurt me because I love Jesus, do you see what he's saying? He said, I'm looking forward to it. I'll participate in Jesus' suffering. Let people hurt me, <laughs> and, and it'll be wonderful for me. He's saying, I want to become like Jesus in his death. Do you remember how Jesus died? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Totally trusting. That's how we want to die. And somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. That means I want to know what, to, what it means to die physically and go to heaven. And on the last day to have my body raised to live forever in the new heaven and the new earth. That's what Paul is shooting for. And now he's going to talk about that a little bit more. Not that I've already obtained all of this, the, the end of my salvation. Um, but I press on. Paul's going to use the word press on twice. And it's a reminder that it is part of our identity as Christians. We are pressing on. We are taking very seriously what it means to follow and believe in Jesus and have him as the Savior and Lord of our lives. I press on to take hold of that heaven for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love that. Do you know that Jesus has taken hold of you? He's wrapped his arms around you, maybe in baptism as an infant or when you came to faith in Jesus as a, an adult. He wrapped his arms around you, and now he's taking you home to heaven like this until I can take hold of my salvation. Paul says, I, I'm pressing on in view of the, what Jesus has done. And he says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have already arrived to the goal of my salvation. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind. And what he means here is, he's not meaning that I want to forget about 
what happened earlier in my life. He's saying, what's in the garbage can, I'm forgetting about it. The good I've done, that my daddy was a pastor, forgetting about it. And I'm straining forward for what is ahead. I press on. There's the word again. That's what it means to follow, be a follower of Jesus. I press on toward the goal. Uh, the goal is heaven. The prize is heaven, which God has called me heavenward, but not on the basis of my good works, but on the basis of Christ Jesus. So I have written six statements, and I'd like you to see if you feel okay about them to help us review just who am I as a follower of Jesus? Would you read them with me? Number one, I am a poor, miserable sinner. By myself, I am guilty in God's holy and just eyes. I deserve his current wrath and eternal punishment because of my sins. The phrase by myself means apart from Christ. This is who I am apart from Christ. Um, and it's not a politically correct way to think, to talk, but it's what the Bible says about who we are. Number two, please read with me. I am unable to offer God anything to make up for my sin. Nothing I am or do can make the guilt of my sin go away. By myself, I am not only condemned before God, I am also helpless and hopeless to change my condemned condition. This is what the Bible says. I can't rescue myself. I have no means of doing so. God's got to do it. And of course he has. He gave us Jesus. Please read with me. I am a believer in Jesus. He took my sin, my guilt, and my punishment upon himself. In his suffering and death, he paid the whole price for my sin. Today, by faith alone, in Jesus alone, I am sinless or righteous in God's eyes. Knowing Jesus is the most important thing I know. Do you agree? Does that define you? Do you believe that you are sinless in God's eyes? And is knowing Jesus the most important knowledge you have in your brain? Please read with me number four. I am on a sure path which leads to eternal life in heaven. This is because Jesus not only died for my sins, but also rose from the dead on the third day. He shares his victory over death with me. I look forward to my death, knowing that the best of life is about to begin. Do you believe this about your death? Does this identify who you are? Are you good with dying, whether it be today or in the distant future, knowing that heaven is your home? Not because we deserve it, but because Jesus is our Savior. Um, two more. Number five, together, please. I am humbled by God's grace or undeserved love. I don't deserve to be saved or to enjoy the benefits of my salvation. I just can't get over that he would love someone like me so much. Do you agree? Does this, is this your identity? Are you so humbled by God's amazing grace that you really can't believe that he would love someone like me so much. Here's the last one. Please read it with me. I am thankful follower or disciple of Jesus Christ. I owe everything to him. I love him so much. Out of thankfulness, my goal in life is to worship, obey, and serve him in all I think, say, and do. I am on the lookout for opportunities to tell others about my Savior. Thankfulness is what defines a Christian. Thankfulness is what motivates a Christian. We want to live for Jesus out of thankfulness for having saved us by his grace. And so these are just ideas to be reminded this week of who are you, who am I as followers of Jesus. Um, so in um, we're also now going to gather our offerings, and before we do, we like to